Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Janine DiGiovanni is with us, a war correspondent who for decades has covered the front lines of conflict. Janine DiGiovanni has personally witnessed the dwindling population of Christians throughout the Middle East, particularly in Egypt, Gaza, Iraq, and Syria. And as a practicing Roman Catholic, she has a personal anguish about what the eradication of Christian communities from the cradle of Christianity will mean. Her latest book, The Vanishing, The Twilight of Christianity in the Land of the Prophet, bears witness to this. Critics have called the book one of poignant authenticity that elaborates the power of faith in trying times. It is in many ways a sad book, but I couldn't put it down. We're pleased to welcome Janine Di Giovanni back to the program and she will tell us about The Vanishing. Now, this is your ninth book. Yes. But, <laughs> but this is a very special book, isn't it? It is. It, it's something I've wanted to write for a long time. I've been working in the Middle East for 30 years, 31 years, since 1990. And while when I started working there and I was covering wars or conflicts, there was one thing that always really um, resonated with me, and that was how minorities Minor, minority communities managed to remain and how resilient they were in the face of many, many obstacles. The Christian community in Iraq, for instance, I first became, well, I'd always been aware of them, but I first worked with them, reported on them in the days of Saddam Hussein. And at that time, um, working under Saddam Hussein as a journalist meant that you were scrutinized heavily by the secret police, the Mukhabarat, and you weren't really allowed to go where you wanted to go or to write about what you wanted to write about. We weren't allowed to have cell phones. My satellite phone was confiscated every night so they could see who I was calling. But for some strange reason, right before the American invasion in 2003, I was given permission to drive the length and width of Iraq. And I knew that this would be a chance to see a country that would not exist ever again in the way that it was then, that it was going to change forever. Now, did you drive alone, or did you have did Saddam sent one of his people to look over your shoulder? Saddam sent a couple <laughs> people to look over my shoulder. I didn't know then. I mean, one was my translator, one was my driver. I wasn't really sure who was the internal spy. I thought it was my translator. It turned out to be my driver. Um, but I was aware that I was being watched, that notes were being taken, that there were cameras in my room, my hotel room. So I was always very careful, especially with the people that I would be interviewing, because of course, the risk for me was much less than it was for them. And it's always like that when you work in sensitive areas or closed countries. So let's pause for a moment. We uh, just went through the period of uh, quarantine and lockdown for COVID. So uh, you really had about two years, uh, and where were you? Well, on March 13th, um, I- 2020. 2020, I, I brought, my son is French, his dad is in France. So I was taking a flight to Paris to bring him, to drop him off for spring break. And I got there and literally the next day, Emmanuel Macron, the president said, you know, we are at war. And the country locked down, and France had a very tight lockdown. Um, literally, Paris, people fled as though it was really terrifying for me. It reminded me of what it must have been like during the war when, when the Germans invaded and people took off for their country, their roots, their country homes. Um, now, unlike America, in France, many families own a portion of their ancestral homes. Um, and my ex-husband's family have a village in, in the Alps in, in France, not the chic Alps, but really the remote, the Vercors, um, remote dairy village where I think there's about 14 people. And the house is 400 years old, unheated, very remote. But I went there with my son, my ex-husband, and three extremely religious Catholic cousins. And there I stayed until the end of May, until lockdown lifted, and then I went back to Paris. Um, so I was between France and the U.S. And that's when you wrote your book. So when I started writing it, and the ideas, the research had been done, really the fieldwork for four heavy years, beginning when I was a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations in 2017. 
and I began my journeys back and forth to the Middle East, to Syria, to Iraq, to Egypt, and to the Gaza Strip. Um, I had, of course, been working in these places for many years, so I had an extensive background, but I was doing very careful um, documentation during that time. But the writing started during COVID, and the book shifted from what was meant to be a book solely about these people, but then it became more a journey of my own faith, which had been lapsed as a Catholic. Um, I guess you'd consider me a lapsed Catholic. But I very much during COVID, um, like many people, I was terrified. And um, as I had during wartime, when I had been terrified, I found that I returned to my childhood faith. It's interesting that uh, during World War II, as people have written about it, uh, in England, the Battle of Britain, uh, people got together, they went to parties, and uh, they, they felt the closeness of other people sustained them in the crisis. Uh, in COVID, you were told to keep away from other people. So it was a very isolating kind of experience. But let's get back to Iraq, uh, because uh, you started to talk about it, and uh, Iraq is a uh, country that was uh, created after World War I, but uh, the area, which was Mesopotamia, I guess, in, in ancient days, uh, was uh, very much uh, involved in not only military history, but biblical history, and particularly northern Iraq near Mosul and uh, Nineveh Plain. I'm talking much too much. Uh, so tell oh, no, us, I'm so tell happy. us about your, tell, I mean, I, I loved your book, and that's where I got all this information, but uh, tell us about, you had, these minders and you were uh, touring Iraq and uh, what did you find? So way back in 2003 what I found were the Christian communities there who are ancient people. I mean Jim the really interesting thing for me is their roots are so deep. They go back 2,000 years. Many of them are descendants of the apostles or the prophets who came there, Jonah and the whale, the apostle Thomas, um, who came there at the time of Christ to basically preach and bear witness and to gather their, their flock. Um, so I remember going to masses um, in the Assyrian churches and the Chaldean churches um, and hearing them pray in Aramaic, which is the language of Christ, um, for, for a kind of protection because they were terrified of the American invasion. The Christians in the Middle East, the ones that I focused on, by and large have always been protected by dictators. So the Iraqis by Saddam Hussein, the Christians in Syria by Bashar al-Assad, and before that his father, Hafez, and in Egypt, Mubarak. So for them... So what accounts for that? I mean, Christianity is supposed to be a humanitarian Absolutely. religion opposed to dictators, and here you have dictators protecting Christians. Absolutely. I think there was a kind of deal with the devil. I mean, none of this is official, of course. This is just something that... Analysts such as myself or social scientists or political scientists have, have seen and have remarked on. I think it's largely because they felt safe under the devil they knew. And in the case of Saddam, he basically allowed them to live in their communities um, as they wanted. What they feared was a change of hands that would mean something radical, something terrifying, something that would cease their existence. Now, the Islamic State who rolled through Mosul in 2014 while I was in Baghdad did exactly that. Their first target, their, well, it was anyone who wasn't like them, and that included non-pious Muslims, but was Christians and the Yazidis. And their goal was to eradicate them. Yazidis, the Yazidis are, uh, they are a Muslim sect. Aren't yes, they? well, they're, they're not Muslim, they're, um, and, but they're not Christian. They're their own faith, which is an ancient faith. Um, They've been unjustly called devil worshippers because they do worship the peacock god, who they believe Satan was a fallen angel. Um, and they've been misjudged and misinterpreted for, for centuries, and they have been heavily persecuted. So the Islamic State, when they rolled through the area, basically trying to eradicate Christians and the Yazidis, um, it was a terrible time. The Christian villages emptied out some people fled however they could. I've heard stories of people fleeing. One, someone just told me that they fled in a, in a hearse, actually. Um, others waited until the last possible moment, then gathered their families, got, took their documents, left. The churches were burnt, were destroyed, were turned into rubble, the crucifixes trampled on. Um, and only now are they beginning 
you know, they're rebuilding their villages, trying to keep their, their communities, trying to solidify them. But there's other things that are also their enemy, not just radicalism. There's climate change and there is um, migration because of no jobs, no future for young people. And this is for the Christians throughout the region that I've written about. I decided to focus on four very distinct groups, which are the Syrians, the Iraqis, the Egyptians, and the, the 800 Christians in the Gaza Strip. I didn't include Lebanon for a very specific reason, and many people say why, because it's such an important part of the population. It's because they're not as endangered. They are not in, they're not, they don't have a real threat of eradication. And I've been told by some researchers that the Christians in Iraq, for instance, might not be there in 100 years. So it was imperative for me to document them now, to get these voices, to do a kind of oral history of these people before they disappear forever, because they are ancient people and this is their ancestral land. And if they migrate uh, from Iraq, where, where did they migrate to? Or where are they going to migrate? The US, when Trump posed the, um, the Muslim ban in 2017, that didn't include Arab Christians. So Christians from Arab lands could still come. Um, so they, a lot of them have family here. There's an enormous community, communities in Michigan, upstate New York, all over the country. Um, Canada, of course, liberal European countries like Sweden. Um, France, of course, is a Catholic country. They've been extremely supportive of, of Arab Christians. Um, they, you know, they want to go anywhere where they can find employment for their kids. Young people want jobs. At the same time, there's this terrible, terrible sense that if we leave, we're leaving a hole in these communities that we have to keep our foothold in. And yet, you know, for a young person who graduates from university, there aren't many prospects. So migration is a real enemy. Climate change is really fiercely important and relevant right now. Iraq is 31% desert. It's, I think, in the top five of the UN's deepest concerns with climate change, droughts, floods. So all of these, these challenges they have are, are enormous. So what was the Christian population of Iraq when you began your work and what is it today? Early in the days of Saddam, there was one census done that gave 1.5 million Christians in Iraq. Now, I mean, I have heard figures between 150,000 and 300,000, probably more on the 150,000. Now, I do want to say that there are communities that are remaining hardy, where the churches are full, where people are going back and they're determined to stay there. But what I really wanted to focus on was the people that were extremely vulnerable and are vulnerable. Let's look at Gaza. From the fourth century, Gaza was entirely Christian until the fourth century. There are now 800 Christians left, mostly Greek Orthodox, but there's Latin Catholics who are basically Roman Catholics, um, some Lutherans, some Baptists, some Evangelical. Um, and they are sandwiched between Hamas, who are the governing, the rulers of Gaza, and the Israeli closures of borders. So there's a siege there that has been going on since 2007. It's almost surprising, uh, and certainly surprising to many people, that there are Christians at any time in Gaza. I mean, was Gaza ever a country? Uh, was it a region? I mean, what accounts for the presence of Christians no, in Gaza? No, it, it, I mean, this is fascinating to me, Jim, and I've been working in Gaza since 1990, and it's only, I'd say, in the past 10 years that I've really been looking at the Christian community there. Um, they're, again, they are the ancient descendants of the original people there. They... Um, you know, what, the danger for them is even more severe, I'd say, than Iraq. Iraq and Gaza are the two places I'm the most concerned about. Um, because for them, the, the siege of Gaza means that when the bombs come, and the last bombing raid was in May, it doesn't differentiate between Muslims, Christian, children, elderly, and Hamas, who the targets are meant for. So they're vulnerable. And the people I spoke to are mainly older people, the population, when I would go to mass there, um, mainly an elderly population. Um, again, Gaza has one of the highest rates of unemployment, but yet one of the most um, highly educated in the Middle East. 
I've written a piece um, for Vanity Fair, which comes out in January, about the youth of Gaza, because probably, and I say this with all honesty, I don't think I've ever come across such interesting, intelligent, highly educated people, young people, a generation that really, really could flourish if the, if the kind of yoke of oppression wasn't on their shoulder and if there was work. But one has the impression that certainly the Arab population, the Muslim population of Gaza, uh, were people who formerly lived in Palestine and were expelled uh, and found, uh, are relocated or, or found homes in Gaza. But was that true of the Christians as well? Or was, you, you seem to uh, uh, say you found they were indigenous. Some, been both. There for centuries. both. Some, some came from villages nearby and after the 1948, the, what they call the Nakba, the catastrophe, emigrated there or migrated there. Some have been there for generations, centuries. I mean, I had this wonderful conversation with these two sisters who were telling me about the kind of the glory days of Gaza when Gaza was um, profitable and their vacations were spent in Beirut and and they felt that they were safe. I think now they're many of them probably the most closed community I worked with and interviewed were the Gazan Christians and when I would try to get them to talk about Hamas, um, it was dangerous for them or they didn't feel comfortable. All they would say was, you know, they don't bother us and yet there was a, a Baptist library that was burnt down several years ago, the last Christian bookstore. Um, but I have to say, I went to, you know, several, I've been to Gaza many, many times, of course, and on my last trips, I would go to all the services, and that ranged from a beautiful Greek Orthodox church to a Latin church to a, um, a Baptist church, which was above the what was then the old bookstore. And... Um, it's, it's kind of surreal, you know, going into what would seem like a, a church in the deep south of America in the middle of Gaza. And I remember long ago when I, worked in, when I lived and worked in Africa, going to a service in Liberia, in Monrovia. And the church there was a kind of storefront. And when I entered, um, the, pre the pastor said, welcome to this foreigner. And they were singing gospel and they were praying the scriptures. And... It just it reminded me that wherever I've gone in the world and wherever I've worked, I've always sought out churches, you know, for my own, even during the siege of Sarajevo. Um, I found the Catholic cathedral during the worst days of the bombing. And I would go and sit quietly and try to gather my, my thoughts and my courage. And I would look around me and around me were people who were praying. And um, essentially I thought, we were all praying for the same thing, which was to keep ourselves and our families safe and alive and to, you know, to bring peace to whatever part of the world I was in, whether it was Bosnia or Africa or, um, you know, the many countries I've worked in, Gaza. Um, there is a profound sense of unity. And that, for me, was one of the reasons I wrote the book. What about the Jewish uh, communities in the Middle East? I mean, uh, yeah. certainly one would think that Iraq. most of them in Iraq and uh, in Syria uh, and uh, elsewhere have uh, uh, moved to Israel, but there still are some Jews in, uh, in Syria and Egypt. Uh, Egypt, Egypt, yes. Syria, yes. Aleppo, um, the, the few incredibly brave ones who remained during the fall of Aleppo in 2016 and the war, Aleppo was truly uh, suffered terribly. The Jewish community of Baghdad is so interesting because um, some of the most vibrant, the culture, the, um, the richness that they brought um, disappeared. You know, first in the 50s, then in the 70s, of course, and then um, Saddam dealt the final terrible blow. And this is what I talk about with the Christians. Like, what, when, when we lost the Jewish community of Iraq, we lost a vibrant part of the mosaic, the cultural mosaic of the society. If this happens with the Christians, not just the Christians, the Turkmen, all of the minorities that make up the Middle East, we're going to have societies that are completely um, the same. And I think that the, the importance, the, the vibrancy and everything, the cultural, the economic, um, the, the, the people that make up the patchwork quilt that is Iraq, it will be lost forever. I remember- So we'll be left with what you've called a homogenized community. 
Yeah, which would be, you know, and I'm choosing my words very carefully because I know many people are sensitive about this, and in no way am I saying that, you know, the Muslim community is to blame for this because there are, there are millions of, of Muslims, that, Muslims that lived alongside Christian, Jews, For Turkmen, centuries. For centuries. So the radicalization and the extreme communities, whether it be Christian, Jewish, or Muslim, radicalism and evangelical communities are, are a danger to everyone, no matter where you are, whether you're in Israel or whether you're in Iraq. Um, I do, I do want to say that I did this very interesting story with a colleague of mine, Tim Judah, in the days before the fall of Saddam. He, his family, came, they were um, Iraqi Jews who came from Baghdad, and they had, they had been, they had left in the 50s. So he was trying to track down the last Jewish community in Baghdad, and I went along with him. It was extraordinary. Um, it was like being sleuths, trying to find out where the synagogue was, trying to find, and we did find the last few families. And I write about Tim in my book. And by chance also, Tim and I were in Afghanistan in 2001 when the Taliban fell. And there we also found the last Jewish community, these two brothers who were harboring a, um, a Torah. And I believe they just, or one of them was left and just recently left. So. I'm always really fascinated by how people cling to their countries despite everything, their courage in remaining in their ancestral lands. And uh, why, what accounts for the fact that they stay, even these very small minorities stay in a, a country that really doesn't want them? I mean, you point out in Egypt, for example, uh, the Christians aren't persecuted so much as they're discriminated against, particularly the poor Christians in the uh, outlying areas, not in Cairo. So your question, why do people remain? Wherever I've worked in the world where I've met refugees, I have never found anyone that wanted to leave their home. If a war comes tomorrow, you would probably remain until the last possible moment because you wouldn't believe it would be coming to you. So I think with the Christians of Iraq, for instance, when ISIS rolled through in June 2014, they didn't go immediately. And I said to some of them, why did you wait till the last minute? It's because no one wants to abandon their roots. No one wants to leave behind, in their case, centuries and centuries of history. And to be a displaced person is absolutely the worst thing in the world. Um, one of my most poignant memories in Iraq was going to this um, monastery called Mar Matai, um, fourth century monastery built into a rock. And there were these Christian families. It was right after the fall of ISIS, so it must have been 2016. And they were celebrating what they said that were still alive. Um, and I looked around them, and you just, when you're with these ancient people, you do have a sense, because in America, we're, it's a new country. We've all come from somewhere else, or our ancestors came from somewhere else, unless we're indigenous people, which you and I are not. Um, so when I'm with them, it's just, I have a sense that I'm with people who are so rooted to their land. Their land means everything to them. It's their identity. They're Christians, but they're Arabs, and they're Iraqis, or they're Syrians, or they're Egyptians. And to take that from them is to literally expunge a, a hugely important part, compo component of their, of their being. So that's why it's absolutely imperative we protect them. Well, Pope Francis went to Iraq in March of 2021. Uh, did, did his visit accomplish anything? It was just at the beginning in, of COVID. It was incredible. It was, it was right at the height of COVID there. And of course, in Iraq, very few people are vaccinated. Um, they, they had a terrible time with, with the virus. Pope Francis, I think his visit was just extraordinary because, you know, he's elderly, he's fragile, but his his background is going into the most vulnerable communities. It comes from his work where he grew up in Argentina. He worked in the poorest areas. Um, and he went there despite advice from all of his top advisors who said, do not go, it's dangerous, you'll get ill. He said, I must be with the people. The mass that he said was um, sent a clear and strong message throughout the world that these people are here. We are protecting them. 
We've got their back. We're not going to let them fade away. I just, I mean, I get chills when I think about what he did. And I watched the mass streaming. Uh, uh, I was just, I was so proud of him at that moment. Okay, unfortunately, because this has been fascinating, uh, we have to end. Uh, so a question for you, Janine Di Giovanni. And the question is, in 50 years, in 100 years, will there be any Christian communities left in the four countries of the Middle East you've dealt with? I hope that my book in some way, people will read it and they'll understand that these are people that need to be protected. If not, I fear, and other political scientists fear, that they will be eradicated, that there will be a biblical exodus and they will no longer be on their ancestral lands. Another biblical exodus. So thank you so much for coming by. This thank has just been wonderful. Me. Good luck with your book, The Vanishing, which really is a must read. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care, be well, and all the best.